Okay, well, thank you very much for being here. We're, we're in for a very exciting morning, I think, because this is uh, one of my favorite areas, which is harnessing evolution towards a number of different uses. And evolutionary thought is starting to work its way into everything from engineering to chemistry to natural history. And what you're going to see today is two exceptional opportunities to look forward and backwards. Well, both of them are looking forward, but two distinct applications of forward-looking evolution. So we have two speakers that are each going to present. And then we're going to uh, have a couple questions amongst the panel, and the panel will come up, and then we'll open up the floor for uh, a good 15 minutes or so, we hope, of questions from the audience. So there's been uh, presentations and participation from both of our speakers already. So I can just give you capsule introductions. And I ask them uh, to tell me one factoid that isn't in the, in the printed material. And for Stuart Brand, our first speaker, he said it doesn't mention that he was in the Army Infantry in the early 60s. And it also doesn't mention that his uh, career as a skydiver ended when his parachute failed. <laughs> so uh, he's been about that daring in his research as well, and I'm looking forward to hearing about it. Stuart, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you. How's our sound? Can you guys hear okay? Yeah. Beth, let's do the light. This is very slide intensive. If I get my first slide, that'll start the intensity. One hundred and fifty years ago, the slide you're going to see shows uh, one artifact from this area, which was this was pretty much a deforested all of New England. And so on both sides of all these stone fences you see in the woods, there were working fields. Since then, the forest has really, really come back, and the Appalachian Trail is one big, long green tunnel from end to end. But what has not come back is some of the animals that were around then. Passenger pigeon was around in perfusion until the late 19th century. It was hunted to extinction, uh, basically by market hunters. These animals were eaten by the ton until they went from five billion to zero in a period of about 30 years. Another local bird was the heath hen. It was kind of a prairie chicken. Uh, it would have been in the meadows and, and grassy fields. And it also was a market hunting animal that was hunted to extinction by uh, mid 19th century in most of the area. Are people here connected with Martha's Vineyard at all? There you go. The last one died on Martha's Vineyard in 1932, Boom and Ben. Also, these woods were one quarter American chestnut, uh, which a fungus came from Asia and wiped them out basically. And by 1940s, they were all gone. Uh, they are going to come back. I'll talk about that actually this afternoon. We'll take that away. Off the coast here was a bird known as the penguin of the north, the great auk that covered the entire North Atlantic, a flightless bird, because it was flightless, bred on just a few islands, hunted to extinction by 1844. For its mainly for its down, for its feathers. And then a little further back, uh, the woolly mammoth was here. Sorry. Oh, that's in there. The woolly mammoth was here uh, when the ice was here. And the glacial maximum 20,000 years ago, uh, the mammoths were here. And uh, they're probably not going to come back here, <clears throat> but they may well come back. The woolly mammoth was um, determined by the study of their DNA, so-called ancient DNA, which has now been examined in detail. Is this me? That was me. Sorry, there's a button that should not be on here. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out the woolly mammoth, everybody thought it was closely related to the African elephant. It's not related to the Asian elephant. It's a little smaller. And there's some of them still around, their DNA is intact. So this starts to lead to the basic process of the extinction, which is that you uh, can work with the DNA that's now been reconstructed of the extinct animals from specimens and fossils, like the woolly mammoth, and bring the differences into the living genome of the current living relative of the animal, if it's pretty close. 
And this is done by a miracle new uh, technique called CRISPR, CRISPR-Cas9. And it is offering the ability of, down to the individual base pair, William Mammoth had four billion base pairs, editing of one allele to replace another allele, one gene to replace another variant of that gene. So working on just the woolly mammoth, uh, is George Church at Harvard Medical School for postdocs jamming away. I'll stroll quickly by some of the stages they are at. They have already moved 16 mammoth genes into living elephant cell lines that uh, control three mammoth traits, uh, long woolly hair, thick subcutaneous fat, and hemoglobin uh, blood that is cold adapted. And uh, later in the process, as we get this going, uh, from that we will be able to recreate basically woolly mammoth embryos, can be implanted Asian elephant surrogate mothers, and out of that comes woolly mammoths. We are already consulting with some Asian elephants on this matter. <laughs> uh, another scientist we're working with is Beth Shapiro at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, she's head of the paleogenomics lab there, and she's just written a book I recommend to you called How to Clone a Mammoth. We started out, uh, when she started it four years ago, you can't clone a mammoth, and ends up saying, well, you can't exactly clone a mammoth, but you can recreate a mammoth. And uh, that's a little awkward for her because actually her team is working on the passenger vision. She's worked on the ancient DNA of mammoths and now is working on the uh, current DNA, the current DNA of the close relative of the passenger pigeon, which is a band-tailed pigeon. And the guy who's really doing that is a scientist working full-time to revive and restore people that are doing this. Ryan Thielen in the back there is the executive director in the blue of Revive and Restore, and Ben uh, Novak works for us full-time. He's now getting his master's in basically the ecology of the passenger pigeon at UC Santa Cruz. And this is one of his slides showing the five stages of de-extinction. In Latin, they're in silico, in vitro, in vivo, ex situ, and in situ. The last two are conservation uh, terminology for ex situ is basically captive breeding. In situ is it's back in the wild, and ideally, uh, so richly back there, you don't have to manage it. And silico is doing the ancient DNA, getting the uh, reconstructing with computers the original, DNA, the original genome. In vitro is doing the editing, and vivo is making a living animal, and you're off and running. Something else we're doing relates to when you get small remnant populations of endangered animals like the black-footed ferret that we're working with, most endangered mammal in North America. What happens is they get inbreeding, that makes fewer of the babies, more inbreeding, fewer of the babies, and that's called the extinction vortex. If you can genetically reverse that, and sometimes it's done by bringing in closely related animals, or I think we can do it by some of the biotechnology approach, that's called genetic rescue. Uh, another case of genetic rescue we're working on, by the way, in case you think Asian elephants aren't gonna be comfortable uh, breeding in the snow, this is one in Ontario. Elephants love to make snowballs. But drunk. <laughs> and, uh, but one quarter of all young Asian elephants die from an ailment called herpes virus. Uh, this is not widely known but we think there's a workaround on this, and George Church at Harvard, who we spent four hours with two days ago, uh, is working on that. And uh, as the slide just informed us, uh, chytrid fungus is also uh, laying low amphibians, frogs, salamanders, uh, all over the world, and that might be treatable genetically. The heath hen really was common, as you can see the market hunting got out of hand and people were saying, please not eat that again. Uh, let's have some of those rare white-tailed deer, <laughs> which we got to be in those days. And um, Ryan and I and Ben Dovach and, and other specialists did an event last summer in Martha's Vineyard saying, you know, we could bring back this bird to Martha's Vineyard and to all of the Eastern Seaboard and uh, raise $50,000 to do some of the work uh, we will go back next week and report on the results of that, uh, which proved what science did not know before, that the <coughs> heath ant was its own species, is probably adapted to this environment, 
a unique way and is worth reviving, and we can probably do that uh, working with a greater prairie chicken, which looks very similar, but probably has some different behavior aspects. Relatively few, few genes using practically domestic chickens for surrogate parents, uh, crank out heath hens and bring them back to the eastern seaboard. Similarly, uh, the great auk, there's a group in England who wants to bring this bird back. Uh, there is a bird with a very similar feeding habits and range called the razorbill that can fly. That's why there's still razorbills. Uh, their genes are close enough, we think we can use that to make the great auk. And the passenger pigeon, uh, the band-tailed pigeon, which is six million years ago, these pigeons split up the North America. One went to uh, the West Coast, that was the band-tailed pigeon. The others came here, that was the uh, passenger pigeon, much more successful, both forest birds, and uh, they're genetically close enough to work with. The passenger pigeon, the male passenger pigeon, is dimorphic, uh, is a very attractive bird. A beauty is not for us, <laughs> it's for her. And once you get a few of these guys and they can reproduce, uh, we I ideally will get sky darkening flocks of these amazing birds back. So Ben Novak made this slide. He would love to see here on the Eastern seaboard uh, passenger pigeons in a few decades, the heath hens and the great auk. And if you traveled fast in a given day, you might be able to see all three of them again. Another one of his slides, he points out, this is all part of the Long Now Foundation I'm president of in California. The Long Now view, looking back 100,000 years, there's the population of these various animals. And you see them going basically down to zero in the last 100 years. What we would like to do over the next 100,000 years is bring these guys all the way back. And that's why we say de-extinction is forever. Thank you very much. I want the mammoth ride. I, I'm, I'm wishing them luck. And, uh, and passenger pigeon is supposed to be tasty. So, yes. yeah. Pigeon <laughs> Maybe the pent up market will be a problem. Okay, so our, our, our next speaker is one of my former colleagues when I was at Caltech, Francis Arnold. Francis has been responsible for really bringing evolution into the world of chemical engineering, and she's going to tell us about some of her exciting work. Francis's exploits that aren't mentioned in the introductory comments are nearly as dangerous as parachuting without a parachute, or with one that doesn't open anyway, which is sort of similar. Uh, and that is that she was a, a cab driver in Pittsburgh for Yellow Cab in 73. In, in and, and so uh, Pittsburgh was, uh, when I visited, I wouldn't have wanted to ride in a cab, let alone drive one. So you are brave. Hey, that was pre-GPS too. Oh, yeah. With a big, fat yellow cab. And if you've driven in the streets of Pittsburgh, they're that big and the yellow cab is that big. So you learn how to do hard things uh, and there weren't too many women doing it then, but you made better money than working at the pizza parlor. So you have heard about recreating the past, and you know that this sequence of letters, the genome, determines whether you're a monkey, a microbe, a woolly mammoth, a T-Rex. And not only that, you've heard that we can basically synthesize, if you can obtain the DNA sequence of any of these things, you can synthesize that DNA in the test tube. You can type out the sequence, email it off to a company in Northern California or Taiwan, and in a few days back, you'll, in a few days, you'll get back in the mail the actual physical sequence of DNA. Then you can put that into a, oh, where'd my, who's got the clicker? Who ran off with the clicker here? <laughs> yeah, that'll help. Now, yeah, that's right, so let's see. So if you can extract DNA from an extant organism, or even an extinct organism, you can sequence that DNA, and we'll talk more about sequencing at the personalized medicine. Here's another pitch for it. You can sequence that DNA, you can synthesize that DNA, you can put that DNA back into related cells, of related animals, 
and recreate that organism. It's not quite science fiction, and it is happening today, and we're talking about the future here. But here's the problem that fascinates me. It's how do you create things that don't exist, that have never existed? How can you use this technology to explore the future? Right? I think it's fascinating to demonstrate that we can re recreate things that have existed in the past. And the reason we can do that is we can copy the genome that encodes that from the actual creature. Right? But we did not compose that genome. Who composed it? It was composed by four billion years of evolution. And the best thing that we can do is read it and copy it. But to me, this genome, it's so complex, it's intricate, it's stunningly beautiful. It's like a Beethoven symphony. And we are barely holding the pencil when it comes to composing the sequence of life for a human, even a, a lowly bacteria, even a virus, we do not know how to write that out. So we cannot create the future if we don't learn how to compose it. So that's what I do at Caltech, is I try to compose things that have never existed on this planet, but that might be beautiful, or that might be useful, and might help us live sustainably. And I'll tell you a little bit about that towards the end. Now, if this is making you nervous, <laughs> let me remind you that humans have actually been composing DNA for thousands of years. We have been modifying the biological world at the level of DNA, starting with you making children and deciding you know, who you're going to mate with to have those children. We've been doing it in the animal world, the plant world, even the microbial world. Every time you put on antiseptic solution on your hands, you are modifying the biological world at the level of DNA by artificial selection. And we've been doing it, creating new plant varieties that have helped explode the human population and support our well-being. We've created animal var varieties. We've created companion animals. Lots and lots of dogs that would not exist on this planet were it not for our intervention. Some of them are beautiful, some of them are less beautiful. But those are human <laughs> creations through the process of natural selection. And if you look at dogs, there have been about 500 generations of dogs. Yet look at the diversity that we have created starting with wolves. And this shows you how rapidly evolution is as an algorithm for design. You think about it. So now combine the technologies that Stuart Brand just introduced to you in 30 seconds, this ability to write DNA and to insert it into cells and they will read it as their own with this rapid pace that evolution can take. So imagine with technologies now, we could do 500 generations in 50 days. What could you create? What could you explore? So I run a laboratory at Caltech that does exactly this. We want to explore where evolution could go. But it's not so easy, right? In nature, it's pretty limited. You've got monkeys with monkeys, worms with worms, and the two don't cross, right? Uh, you usually have two parents. But what if you could have 32 parents? Or you could cross monkeys and worms. What would you get from that? So not only can we speed up evolution, but we can go where nature would not even think of going, right? Or couldn't because of actual physical limitations. It's hard to imagine how a monkey and a worm could mate. But I can do that in the test tube. In the test tube. <laughs> <laughs> and please do not think I am making Wolford. Wolford is a photoshopped creature, but <laughs> in, in the test tube, remember I can synthesize anything. So I could recombine in the test tube DNA from any species I want. I could have 33 parents. I have absolutely no idea what the benefit to that is. But the great thing is, because it's DNA, I can throw out most of the things that I make and have no compunction, unlike my children, which sometimes I would like to throw out, but I'm not allowed to, with 
the things that I make in the laboratory, at most there's some microbes, uh, we can explore where the future could go. These are actually the things that I make. I do not make animals, so maybe that will calm things down. But I have lots of sex going on in my lab. I see we had sex in America in this room just before this session. You missed a great session if you weren't here. But this is sex in California. We take proteins, the DNA that encode proteins. And believe it or not, you use proteins in everything from food to laundry detergents. And you want to have better ones all the time. I can create these wonderful molecules that have never existed on the planet by recombining DNA, starting with things that exist today. The history, I see Lewis Lapham here. The history of all of evolution, I can take from the bottom of my shoe. I can build on that history to, re to create whole new things. I can make molecules that copy DNA, molecules that treat disease. I can make molecules that carry things back and forth inside the cell. These are the, these are the molecules of life. These are the things that do things. And so when I recombine DNA and I decide who goes on to reproduce and make the next generation, I can measure their fitness. You know, am I making the racehorse of the DNA that encodes a protein? With this, I can make things like humanized enzymes that that recombine and make chimeras with bacterial enzymes to treat human disease. Even more exciting, perhaps, is that I can breed microbes by putting new catalysts in them that can convert renewable resources into the products that we currently get from pumping oil out of the ground. Someday, we will have to stop doing that. But right now, if we could convince organisms to take abundant renewable resources, sunlight, garbage, even plant waste materials. And instead of making more organisms, which natural selection has had to program them to do, what if they could turn that renewable resources into the product we need for our daily lives in a sustainable fashion? My newest company, I, I do this, this is basic technology, so a lot of people take these ideas and, and start companies, and I'll just share the newest ventures is, is in, is in um, crop protection. Imagine if you could interfere with the pests that eat and destroy the crops that are so much needed to feed the world. Imagine if you could make the sex pheromones of the insect pests and just spray a gram of these pheromones on fields to confuse the pests. You don't kill anybody, there's no toxicity whatsoever. And so we can make the microbes that make these authentic sex pheromones and completely change the face of crop protection. These are just a few little vignettes of the capabilities that biology has that we can begin to exploit if we can learn to compose that DNA. So I'm going to stop here, and I'm sure you've got plenty of questions for the both the past and the future. So, I, I, I don't know even where to start. It's so exciting what the opportunities are. What you didn't get to say much is the, the how. So I'm assuming that the pieces of DNA aren't mating and making little plasmids or something like that, but I guess they kind of are. So can you say something about the how? Actually, the how is frighteningly easy. And many of you have kids in high school or grandkids in high school. You can do these experiments pretty much in high school laboratories, right? I just told you, you could, Type out a sequence of DNA and just email it off to a supplier, and you get actual DNA back. But all you have to do is put that into bacteria that, where they put holes in their cell walls, and they just take it up. We know bacteria can take up all sorts of genetic information. They start reading it, and they, you know, their monkey minds make this, these proteins. They read the DNA. And this is all the basic genetic engineering. 30 years of revolution in genetic engineering has given us this capability such that, yes, students in high school laboratories can do it. Use the term uh, directed evolution. Well, directed evolution is artificial selection. Mm -hmm. 
right? I direct it. I decide who lives and who dies here, just like farmers have done for a long time. At a molecular level. You can absolutely select at the molecular level because you can read out the fitness, whatever it is, the properties. Now, some people come and ask me, oh, I want it to make money. That's kind of hard to read out. We need some sort of chemical signal. Mm -hmm. you know, does it catalyze this reaction? Does it do that? Yeah, so in, in trying to do that, I guess the, the thing that's amazing is the population size that you can start with. So you don't just order what it is you think you want. You can make it more varied, mutate it, and then keep the ones that did something novel that you like. That's easy. If you can make one, you can make a billion in this thing. Because all these proteins that I mentioned, you use these tools for the de-extinction. They just copy. Polymerase chain reaction technology was invented, what, 30 years ago now, won the Nobel Prize. That's magic almost. They just sit there and copy DNA, but you can dial in the mistake rate. You know, so, so evolution is a basis of recombination, but also a few mutations. So you cigarette smokers, if you're reproducing, you're doing a good job for evolution and radiation <laughs> and you name it. So random mutations going, <laughs> go in there. I, I no see telling new, what you'll get. A new advertising <laughs> campaign. <laughs> so, so Francis, in the case of your experiments, the costs are relatively modest because it's mostly test tube. Mammoths seem like they'd take really big test tubes. <laughs> so, so what's the cost, Stuart? For... That's funny. That was the cover of National Geographic, was this enormous test tube with a mammoth coming out of it, <laughs> along with a dodo and various other extinct animals. Um, what's the cost? To bring this whole <laughs> toolkit to conservation, of being able to head off extinction animals that have genetic issues that you can cure, and to bring back some extinct species that we might welcome back, usually for ecological as well as aesthetic reasons, probably $2 million a year for 10 years, the whole thing goes forward. Um, as it is, we're going along you know, for less than a million dollars in three years of work and six conferences and 140 scientists who are all working on this set of issues so far, conservationists and molecular biologists, uh, you can do a lot with a lot of people just sort of chugging along with their lab occasionally. We've got probably six scientific papers in process this year. Um, that you can do with you know, tens of thousands of dollars coming in, sometimes $100,000. But to really crank up and do the engineering level of not only woolly mammoths, but the heath hen and the rest of them, where you're going to move on into captive breeding and so on, that gets up to something like $2 million a year. That's surprisingly <laughs> less than I was fearing it would I be. Know, you know, it's amazing. Less than a, you know, a bicycle and pedestrian fly over on a freeway somewhere, get back all these animals. Yeah, it's amazing. So uh, I'm, I'm a little bit curious. Your, your wolf-seagull hybrid, it brings up the, um, <laughs> the fact that I saw Jurassic Park. Uh, <laughs> it brings up the, so what are the risks? The risks are people thinking that Jurassic Park is how it works. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to, to cause you One, grief. No dinosaurs, I'm sorry. If the DNA is gone, uh, as they say, you cannot clone from stone. So, and that's all we got. Basically, the, the oldest so far revivable DNA we found is 700,000 years old. A, a horse uh, in the, in the, it actually is one of the best Shapiro's projects in Alaska. Um, Though it's amazing what can be uh, found just in, in bones. So the reason we know the Neanderthal genome in some ways better than the human genome is just from a couple of dried up bones and caves in various places. So the, basically it's the computer powers, this massive data processing. You're putting together chunks that are 150 base pairs long, reordering them in a, an order that makes sense ideally scaffolded against some related animal whose full genome you already have, and you can reconstruct that amazing four billion base pair sequence pretty damn accurately, and then start to work with it. Uh, so, you know, the, in the technology, I think sort of a message to take away from this meeting is that biotech is moving so damn fast, um, 
the digital revolution was just digital code. It's basically communications and calculation. Here we're talking about the code of life. And that's the fundamental thing that I think is going to play out in this century. Uh, there's an important distinction, which is that all digital code is engineered, and no biological code uh, that exists for the last three and a half billion years is engineered at all. So you, you can't even think about reverse engineering it. You've just got to figure out the really complicated it's patches all the way down. Uh, and all we can do is add patches. But you know, it's being done very adroitly, and that's what's happening in the center. Sounds great. So, Francis, could you say a little bit more about the range of molecules? Because I think one of the things that's exciting is that it makes what we think of as natural products. The space of that gets huge then. Sure. Evolution works at all scales, from molecules to ecosystems, right? That's how everything in the biological world has been designed. So, in principle, you can use that as a forward engineering tool at all of those scales. In practice, of course, the complexity grows. And I'm sure, also, I wanted to address the risk, right? Mm -hmm. I don't make animals, so they will not fly into your backyard. Um, <laughs> Stuarts might Mine fly will. into your yeah. backyard. <laughs> <laughs> but I make microbes that, where we hope that the benefit will far surpass any of the risk, right? Mm -hmm. We don't make viruses. Uh, but there's been a lot of debate about, you know, working with viruses and gain of function. But that's an evolutionary process, very similar to what I've been talking about. Uh, so one of the questions is, you know, are these genetically modified organisms if they're product of selective breeding? Probably they are if they're chimeras of monkeys and worms, right? Um, so what are the questions about if these are organisms that are going to go out into the universe, so to speak. But once again, humans have been doing this for a long time. This is not something that's really fundamentally new. It's just that it can move a lot faster now. And I should add on, on the risk question, which I didn't really answer, is one of the great benefits of knowing everything you're doing at the genetic level is, so for example, you might say, well, what if you bring back the passenger pigeon and it turns out they have some uh, endoviruses in its genome that uh, could get loose in the world and do an epidemic among birds or who knows what? And the answer to that is uh, we now, because we have the knowledge at the base pair level of these genomes as we're working with them, you can identify the endoviruses, the retroviruses that might be an issue, and take them out. In fact, this is already being done. Uh, with some organisms uh, in an amazingly productive way. And with CRISPR-Cas9, I know of one case where they removed up to 63 genes at a time uh, that were all virus, retrovirus genes. And so you just cleansed that organism of what might have been a risk. So this is a great advantage. It is what is moving beyond, the, we're talking this afternoon about GMOs. Um, and that was called genetic engineering, and that was where you sort of shot a gene that you hoped would turn into something useful uh, into a corn plant or whatever, and, and sometimes you got what you wanted. With this level of CRISPR-Cas9, you're way, 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 way more precise, and you're not taking chances as much. That's great. Well, I think now would be a good time to open the floor up for the audience. And oh, so, that's great. Look at that. I, I don't think Steve Coonan's allowed to ask a question, so we're going to skip over since I think Steve hired both Francis and me. Or that's right. So, so we're not going to take any questions. The, no, not a chance to start with. But right behind you looks like a very inquisitive mind. Yes, the microphone. And uh, give your name, and okay. probably better if you stand. Um, my name is Doug, Doug Albrecht. Uh, I guess, I mean, this is fascinating what both of you are doing but it makes me reflect on what, what this means for humans. And is this technology applicable to humans? What are the ethics associated with that? Are we going to see recreation of our loved ones that we want to bring back? What does it all mean? But. Is personalized medicine going to talk about that? Not at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> I that's, that's too yeah. personal. Cloning. Yeah. You know, we needed to clone you for those multiple sessions. That's yes, <laughs> yes. But so that's, that's, that's really the question. How far has the technology gone? If you can write out any DNA, you could write out 
you know, the perfect human or the perfect child or yourself and try to clone that. Technically, actually, it's not quite as easy as Stuart is saying in 10 minutes, right? There, there are a number of techno problems. We, we cloned sheep, Dolly the sheep, but Dolly was not a perfect sheep. Dolly died young and had arthritis, and there were a number of problems with, with that. We don't know what the downsides are. So there are moral, some legal bans on working with humans, but they were just, uh, they just demonstrated the technology in China just this year. And more coming from China. Oh. The, um, where I think you'll see it with humans is uh, eliminating of diseases that are genetic. And in some cases, this can be done uh, very, very specifically. There's an allele that causes the disease. If you can remove that from the eggs that are about to become your children, uh, you may well want to do that. And that's already in, in progress in certain respects. In Britain, the, the three-parent child aspect is uh, mitochondrial diseases are not from the, from the, the basic genome, but from the you know, organelle genome that's in there. And so the, what is now legalized and I think starting to work in Britain is, um, this is human germline engineering. Uh, what they're doing is if a mother who would like to have children has mitochondrial diseases in her background, and they can be horrible to the children, what she can do is get an egg, an oocyte, from another woman who has healthy mitochondria, take that with the nuclear DNA from the mother to be into that in the standard process and then implant that egg which has healthy mitochondrial DNA and the mother's nuclear DNA into her uterus and she gives a child who not only will not have any of these mitochondrial diseases but will not pass them on to the children. That's the beginning of something I think we will see more of. Okay, Steve's reminding me of a pay raise he gave me a while ago. So, uh, Steve, do you? Can... Unfortunately, I, I read sign language and it wasn't pretty. No. So, so, stand up and okay. say who you uh, are. Steve Coonan. Um, I think I, one of the problems whenever you start messing with DNA, or the genome, mm -hmm. is proving that the changes you've made will in fact result in the traits that you Correct. expect. Right? Absolutely. Phenotype, genotype, all right. of that. I can understand for Francis at the molecular level, that's pretty easy to do. You make a million copies, you use high throughput screening, something like that, and you find the ones that you want. Uh, elephants have a famously long gestation time. Yeah, 18 and, months. And I don't think they do twins or triplets. Right. So you're going to have to use a lot of elephants Cloning is not particularly perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, Dolly was one of, what, 80 or something like that, that, that actually, uh, 300, okay, I don't know what, the, but it, it's a big number. So how are you going to get around that barrier? Um, George Church points out that, that one of the great things is you're writing and you're reading DNA. So you write your DNA, you make the changes, and you can read it right away to see if the changes that you made were indeed the changes that you want to make. This allele has replaced that allele. Thank you very much. Now you can, uh, you're doing uh, the development of a beginning embryo. And the embryo will show most of the traits early on that you're maybe interested in. There's also what are called organs on the chip where you can basically show, uh, yeah, we wanted to get subcutaneous fat, uh, and lo and behold, it looks like subcutaneous fat is gonna happen. We're okay with that. Uh, and so you can do many, many stages, and especially with mammoths, maybe not so much with pigeons or with teeth ends, uh, which reproduce pretty rapidly, and you, what you'll get is what look like hybrids. Uh, you'll get a few of the traits you wanted. Great, uh, keep those, and keep those birds, and breed them with some, maybe some birds you've developed that have some other traits that you wanted. And you're finding out in captive breeding, are they a functional bird? Do they reproduce okay? Uh, and if so, those are the ones you work with. And uh, then you're sort of in a standard breeding program. It's a combination of engineering and breeding that uh, proceeds. So the, the process is incremental enough and checked enough along the way. And obviously more of these techniques are developing every week <laughs> at this point. So uh, there's confidence that you don't have to create a whole woolly mammoth to find out if you got it right. Other questions? Maybe from this side of the room in the back? 
Uh, Rich Melman. Yeah. Um, how do you handle all the epi Sorry. all the epigenetic uh, part of the, the problem? Uh, you know, DNA. Let's talk about DNA at the species level is a little glib, since you know theoretically we should be able to turn a chicken into a dinosaur if we understood the epigenetic there's, aspects of it. There's a, a theory of, of doing that. The chickenosaurus is a I mean, a Jack, uh, I forget his name, has been pushing for a while. And, you know, that may well happen. And, and it, you could probably breed birds long enough to see if they were pretty persuasive velociraptors. Um, the, I'm sorry, the, the, the epigenome and the, the markings there. And I, I think the tools for... Astonishingly, yeah. the um, epigenome is the parts of the genome that... Uh, basically changed during the lifetime. It's acquired characteristics that look like Lamarckian evolution. And, uh, and they get passed on to the, to the offspring. Um, as George Church says, epigenetics is still genetic. And one of the astonishing discoveries lately with ancient DNA, with, with fossil and, and museum specimen DNA, is it degrades in a way that lets you know where it was methylated, that is where the epigenetic capability was in place to play out. And so we are now getting, you know, utter astonishment, epigenetic information, even from these fossils. And so some of that you can build into what you're rebuilding. Still, a lot of it's going to be cut and dry. Uh, remember, the main thing you're doing with, say, a passenger pigeon from a bantail pigeon, bantail pigeon is already a pretty functioning bird. And you're making some adjustments to that. So you could, away, in a way, say this is just nothing but a doctor, band-tailed pigeon who's got his own epigenetic stuff going on and his own mitochondria, his own uh, microbiome and, and habits and so on. And you're, you're moving it just the way we do with breeding animals generally. Uh, so the, you're, you're starting with a functioning animal. You're not trying to recreate something from scratch. And starting with a functioning animal, and as you get more and more into the wild, all animals and plants evolve all the time. They're evolving mostly in contact with each other, what's called coevolution. And so uh, once they start to get into what's called soft release of moving gradually from captive breeding into the woods, uh, they are adapting to what's available for food, adapting to the seasons, adapting to each other, adapting to their predators and their parasites and all the rest of it. And uh, as the greatest line in Jurassic Park is, life finds a way. Do you, uh, hold on for the microphone. I'm just doing this to make her run. This is great. <laughs> who should get to choose? Oh, my name is Chris Kastabak. Um, who should get to choose uh, in terms of what becomes de-extinct? You have an idea about the heat, and somebody else might have an idea about something else. Um, the molecular biologists are excited about all of this. The conservation biologists are the ones who are, uh, you know, they're deciding who gets to live and die now of endangered animals. And this is basically extension of their realm into uh, helping the public think through, would we welcome this particular animal back? If it's a parasite or disease, probably not. Uh, if it's keystone species, like the passenger pigeon was, or the woolly mammoth was, they created the whole mammoth step in the far north, we would like to have that back for climate reasons, then you're likely to get the approval. All of this stuff goes to government or regulations and conservation organizations and global oversight, and one of the things we're doing with Revive and Restore is making sure, one, the process is responsible, and two, that it's transparent. So people know from sessions like this every step that's going on. And if they say no, then nothing happens. Uh, here in the... They'll but say this, is, this is really very much like what Adam Lowe was talking about. This is rematerializing the yeah. ancient world, right? And that doesn't preclude it. I mean, somebody has to make the choices about it, but it also doesn't preclude future art, right? There'll be future things. So all of these things oh. can coexist. You can rematerialize the ancient art of evolution, and you can explore the future. An amazing performance piece. Yes. <laughs> okay. yeah, I, I see question. all the artists that you're just picking up in. Uh, my name is Ken Cooper. Uh, I'd like to um, learn if this you believe that uh, what you do has increased or diminished your spirituality. 
Well, I think the glory of the biological world is an incredibly spiritual experience. To, I live in California, which is a magnificent spiritual experience just to go out into the desert and see what life exists in such a, such a place and such a diversity of life. I think my understanding of evolution and, and what evolution has done and where evolution can go is a tremendously spiritual experience. So it's in, definitely increased my And to see how we're all interconnected. We are, we are all one and the same with just a few mutations. You can be Stuart Brand or a microbe. <laughs> <laughs> so for some people, it's fewer mutations than for others. <laughs> we, we have a question in the back. Excellent point, though. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Andy Vadney. Um, I run a prep school for boys not far from here. And one of the questions that I have sitting here is, I'm sure, Francis, all of this works. You're doing basic research. But one of the things you said made me start wondering, what am I going to tell the kids? Um, mm. So you're doing the basic research. And then, as you said, you hand this off to companies who are going to take this further. So The kids do the company. The, ki okay, the kids. OK, great. The, See, the, your I kids like this come idea. to my lab. They, 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 this is a kid-run operation. Stuart goes out and talks about it, but the kids do the work. The kids do the work in my lab. They come to Caltech at age 18, and they want to do this. So they I, love it. I, I want to push this in my school, but my question is, who owns, eventually, who owns the patents on these life forms that will originate from this? Well, the, discover, the inventors, right? And I don't, I don't think you patent woolly mammoth because that already existed. But we do create new life Very forms. Right. And if those are useful, and it takes millions of dollars to go out and market them and create a company based on it, the students own those. The students and the university own those patents. And then they go out and build, build a business based on it. But the students absolutely adore doing that yes. because it, they, they've created it. Yeah, so case law is still evolving on this. It's now no longer to patent life forms uh, as such, but it is possible to patent the Proteins. processes that go into it. Or the proteins. And, and the undergrads, depending on how they did the work, if it depends on how much the university was involved, it's either the students and the university, or in some cases it can j just be the students, I think, that could hold the IP. But, yeah. Uh, in the case yes. of de-extinction, you're dealing with a major case of prior art. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> if you do your job right, <laughs> you, you don't but want it to be patentable. That'll be interesting. OK, other questions. We've got just a few minutes. So here in the middle, there's a microphone on its way to you. Thank you. Uh, this is, I'm Wendy Murphy. The question, I guess, is for Stuart Brand. You said, if I heard you right, that it's the oldest DNA that you've been able to bring back to life or replicate or whatever is 700,000 years. Correct. Do you know what causes those limitations, and are you likely to be able to push that age further back with advancing science? It's, yeah, it'll probably go back a little bit, but I, I would be surprised because back more than a million years, talking to the ancient DNA scientists that I know, um, it's a fragile molecule DNA, and it it, uh, it starts being as soon as the creature dies, the DNA starts degrading, and uh, everything goes after it. Plus, uh, what you're getting out of these fossils and museum animals is no end of contamination. Basically, you've got the DNA of every curator who's handed the hand of the museum <laughs> specimen since it went into the museum. Uh, in, 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 you know, I'm told that you get a bone like this, and there's no DNA in this end of the bone, and the other end of the bone that looks exactly the same. There's actually pretty good workable DNA. So the the the, de the degradation process is universal but spotty, and uh, the, you know it's a black art of very very adept people like Fonte Pavo in, in Germany who can you know re find a good source, and then bring it back to uh, the full genome. It's very tricky business. So 
I, so we'll get I, some woolly mammoth human hybrids then yeah. from some of those mistakes. <laughs> and, and we got to some some that, Francis. <laughs> yeah. I can see your next slide. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be bad. Okay, time for just a couple more questions here near the front. Yes, I'm Daniela Bonaferichara. Um, I have a question about de-evolution, and you mentioned the cleaning out of endoviruses and other things mm -hmm. from the DNA, but, but you also mentioned co-evolution, and so you're reviving things that went extinct some time ago, mm -hmm. and the rest of the biome kept evolving, mm -hmm. and now suddenly they're going to interact again. And so what are your concerns about that? For example, you know, will this, uh, I forget the name, the hen, you know, be a better host for avian flu or yeah. whatever. Yeah. And, no, and so what are your concerns? The yeah. great thing is um, the question of sort of what's called reintroduction in conservation. There's been 474 cases of reintroduction already in conservation. We're basically like bringing the wolves back to Yellowstone Park, where they've been gone for 100 years. They're bringing beavers back to Sweden, where they've been gone for 400 years. They're extirpated, as they say. So it's effectively as if they had gone extinct in Sweden. They bring them back in, um, they look around, they look to see if there's any trees, if there's any flowing water. They go and make a dam, uh, nibble down some of the trees, and blend right in. The question then would be, what do the other animals do about that? And coevolution, as you're pointing out, goes on all the time, and basically the other animals, if these animals survive, not all make it. Some in reintroduction fail. Um, everybody sort of moves over, because that's what they do all the time. And some of the parasites discover a big new mammal, hot dog. Uh, you know, some of the uh, predators figure out how to nab a, a beaver when it's out cutting down a tree. And the life goes on. Life finds a way. So, Francis, how do you, I mean, you've got the same problem when you release yeah. microbes or bioproducts into the field. I mean, so you're going to put a sex pheromone. Well, I mean, sex you, pheromones are just molecules. Uh, we don't I know, release oh, anything. Oh, you don't release we don't the release organism. Anything. Okay, because yeah. I was wondering if you're going to like create Times Square or something. In a very, <laughs> you know, we don't release anything. Uh, okay. No, we just make proteins. Proteins are non-self-replicating. So you can buy those in your laundry detergent. The laundry detergent proteins in your Tide box are made by the methods that I invented. There you go. Isn't that compelling? <laughs> Chris, is, is this nanotechnology where you're just having to use biology as a way to make nanotech type? Well, that, that's an extension. Right? Mm -hmm. If you could, I mean, biology is so powerful, but we don't know how to write it. So evolution is the only way to do it. So nanotech is an extension. Little and so shelter. one final question, if there's a hot one. Okay, here, uh, oh, you, actually, she was the most patient in the back. I, so can we have the microphone just for a second? And we promise to hang around and answer. Uh, right there. Hi, I'm Carla Shimbati, and I have a question for Francis. I'm sure you get many requests. Um, mention one that you were scared to help with your technology, and one that you were most proud of. Oh, gosh. One I was scared to uh, help. That, oh, I didn't want to use my technology to help. Well, in the early days, people were exploring the evolution of viruses. Right, to try to make viruses, for example, for gene delivery. Uh, they were changing the infectivity of those viruses, and we felt that that was not something that we wanted to explore. Of course, 15 years later, people did it and demonstrated that you could do that, but I decided I didn't want to do that. And the most proud of are certainly the organisms that make fuels and chemicals. We know we can do that. Economically, it's hard when Crops are expensive and oil is cheap to make money, right? So it's not a big business right now. But someday, that's going to change. Sunlight is cheap and oils are going to be expensive. And that technology will be there. And that's probably a good yeah. note to end on. <laughs> <laughs>